Okay, so this is the last presentation for today, so I hope uh, I hope to be a bit shorter than, than the time and give floor to, to Roberta for commenting to all of you for the discussion. Uh, yeah, I will present a, a couple of ideas that I have formulated spring this year with two colleagues of mine who are unfortunately not here, Piotr Arak and Piotr Kowiecki. Uh, they are presented in the policy paper that you can grab outside and if they are gone there will be more tomorrow, I think. So, um, I would like to kind of, we, we talked a lot about temporary jobs in Poland, we use terms duality, segmentation and, and, and things like that. So, uh, what, I would make, what I would like to make clear is that there is a huge internal difference between all the non-permanent contracts in, in Poland and I would like to label, label it as a duality within duality because the difference between the civil code contracts and the, uh, the civil law contracts and the fixed term labor code contracts is huge, especially in terms of um, rules of uh, terminating the contract and, uh, and taxation. And I will give, give you more details uh, later on. When we look at the number of workers, very well here, but just to, just, just to make clear, you can see that basically what we have observed since 2002, since 2012, that means the increase of, in the number of all temporary workers in Poland from 1.5 million in 2002 up to 3.2 in 2012. I can draw that into 2014 for all temporary workers, but I am not able to do it for workers with civil law contracts only because the data that I that I show here with civil law contracts only is taken from the Minister of Finance. This is the number of people who file tax, uh, uh, who file tax uh, declaring that they only receive income from civil law contracts. That's the most recent I know is 2012. You can see that actually when we look at this huge growth that happened here when the unemployment was rather high, around 20% or employment rate, it, is, it was not overall driven by the growth by the growth of number of workers with civil law contracts only. So there is a huge increase in the number of people who have employment contracts, which are fixed term, but the policies that could address their situation are sometimes the same, but sometimes very different, uh, like those who can, be, who can be invented to think what happens with this group, which also has in increased dramatically. Uh, the Ministry of Finance data shows that there were uh, nearly one million of people in 2012 working only with civil law contracts. There was another study by Polish Statistical Office which showed that this is above one million in 2013, a million point, point two, if I remember correctly. Uh, the, fact that the, the fact that there was this study by Polish Statistical Office gives us some hope in that in the future Polish Statistical Office will include in the labor force survey the civil law contract as a separate category. Because one of the facts that we are that we really fail to identify the causes and, and to and to create really detailed policy policy proposals is that in the most important sources of information on the labor market like labor force survey, we have them all put into one into one, one group. So in the, present, in the rest of the presentation, I will focus mostly on the people who are working on the civil law contracts. And the f main three institutional differences between civil law contracts and the employment, employment, uh, and the employment, uh, in, in employment contract, labor code contract, are the following. First of all, it's the lower social security contributions. Uh, which translate into higher net wages for the worker and lower total labor cost for the company. That means that substituting the labor code contract with a civil law contract actually offers some benefits to both sides. And when you look at polls conducted by some institutions working on the labor market, there is one uh, website which, which conducts uh, uh, surveys of, of people from time to time, and you look at how many polls accept higher wages in return for 
let's say, worse contract. So the number of the share of people who accept such a trade-off is sometimes 75 percent, sometimes 60 percent of the people. So when we when we when we talked about civil law contracts, it is not always that people are forced to that. We can say that they are often myopic and they prefer a high, higher net income uh, instead of, let's say, contributing to the to the to the social security system. So it is important to. To, to remember about that. And also, <coughs> there was a slide presented by Joanna earlier today, uh, which was late in her presentation, so it was presented very fast, but I think that it was important. The difference in the total tax and social security wage for people, for low earners in Poland, people earning minimum wage, the difference in tax wage for a civil law contract and the employment contract can be above 25, 30 percentage points. So the incentive is huge. Moreover, the minimum wage is not binding for civil law contracts. This is also important, especially during the Great Recession and during the period of increasing the minimum wage in Poland from around 31% of the average wage in 2007 to 43% of, of the average wage last year. And finally, the civil law contracts are much easier to tam terminate than regular contracts, also the fixed term employment contracts, and moreover, they create less requirements for employers. There is no sickness benefit payment, there is no obligation to paid leave, and so on. And I will try, in, in, our, in, our, in, my, in my presentation, I will try, try to address, address these differences one by one. So the first proposal is, surprise, surprise, is to try to introduce a single contract in Poland. The, the, the how, how do we frame, is the main, the main important framing of, of it for us is that let's try to make privileges depend on the tenure, on the length of the tenure, of the length of the relationship between a work and a company, and not on the, not on the type of, of the contract itself. And uh, there are four more, more important, four, four most important uh, pillars, let's say, of, of, uh, of our proposal, proposal how the single contract could work in Poland. The first one is that, yes, it has to be much more flexible at signing than the current labor code contract are. So contrary to the Spanish proposal where you try to, over the, when you try to, av to, 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 to achieve the average, let's say, level of protection over the life cycle of a relationship between the worker and the firm, considering that our challenge is the civil law contracts, I propose something which is an average between a current employment contract and, co and civil law contract. So within the first three years, I would like to strike a, pro uh, a level of protection that is between zero protection for the civil law contracts and the current protection offered by, offered by, uh, by, the, the, by the labor employment contract. And, uh, and currently, we, and, uh, and we think that after three years, the single contract could converge to the uh, current rule of uh, to the current uh, to the to the labor code contract as it is right now the open ended contract of course there are there are two 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 caveats here i know people who say this is not really a good idea and i don't like and this, there are I know people who say that we don't really support single contract in poland because that would mean that in the long term you would reduce the protection of people on permanent contracts so, so they interpret the, the proposal as a, this is a first step to actually undermining the social security in Poland. But I also know people who say, I'm not really a fan of single contract, because once we introduce that, we cannot decrease the protection of permanent contracts in the long term. So there are two, two, two confronting views, views on that. So let me just say that, that at the moment we say that let's, do not tackle the insiders who, and, and let's say that the, the protection of three years plus of the tenure is as it is, and, I would, and, and currently I think that the kind of like a smooth transition with the notification period and uh, uh, let, with the uh, severance pay into the rules which apply to the three years tenure right now would be, would be, would be a good starting point for discussing the, for discussing the, for discussing the proposal. Moreover, social secure, security benefits will obviously be paid from the single contract, as it is an employment contract. And, of course, the minimum wage will be binding for this kind of contracts. Uh, and it would also then, in that case, make sense to define 
minimum wage in terms of hourly wages rather than monthly wages. So what, what, does, it mean, uh, what does it imply as well? That, that implies that the civil law contracts should be scrapped because if we, don't, if we, re, if we still have them in the system, then they in, it's basically no way to, to move to the single contract if, if the much uh, more, uh, let's say, flexible option is still available. Uh, I think that the fixed term, that both fixed term and permanent contracts are available. So you can feel, think of a, of a fixed term contract as a way to contract uh, seasonal, uh, seasonal jobs and things like that. Uh, what is a good thing? What, what, what is, a, I think, that one of the most important aspects here? It offers, offers a path to stable employment, which is currently lacking in Poland, especially for many young people who, who kind of struggle to, 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 to get this path to the stable employment but allow some flexibility at just workforce. There is no way I can explain it as good as Marcel, so I will move forward. It is also, I think that it also improves the motivational structure. Currently, there is the famous pay paper of the famous Nobel Prize winner which says that unemployment as a working discipline device, right? So currently the civil contract works as a worker discipline device in Poland. If you uh, if, if, if there is a risk that you're, you're going to be shirking, we're going to switch you to the civil law contracts and <coughs> straight away and keep you in this kind of constant fear that, that we can fire you day by day. So, so the improved motivation, motivational structure, I think, is very, very important uh, in, in my view because it allows us also to, let's say, improve the labor relation and to, to improve maybe the labor productivity, to reduce the costs of monitoring people, stuff like that. Maybe that sounds naive, but still we, we, we can discuss how much realistic it is. At the same time, that means that, the, that, to, that if we scrap civil law contracts and introduce uh, social security contribution on all contracts, then we have higher tax wage than on civil law contracts currently. Well. This is something which will happen anyway, because today in the parliament there was a discussion that the rules of how the social, con social security contributions are paid from civil law contracts are about to change. To those of you who don't know them, because there are many, many guests here, currently if I sign a civil law contract with my, with my worker, Carol, if I sign a one contract and he has no other entitlement, let's say, to social security, it is, I, need to, I, I have to pay, both of us have to pay exactly the same amount of contribution like if, if I were to, to, to employ him on the labor co code contract. But if we sign two contracts, one for let's say 100 zlotys and the other for let's say 10,000 zlotys, Carol will pay contributions only from 100 zlotys and the other contracts will not, be, will not be taxed. So currently the government wants to increase this, let's say, basic level of contribution up to the minimum wage. So the taxation of civil law contract is about to increase anyway with the negative impact on the net incomes of workers and with the positive impact of total labor costs. So actually what we want to do here is not that, is not that exotic because it has been discussed anyway. And we have proposal number two to sweeten that. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned that the, that the taxation of the low, way, low paid people is relatively high. So we would like to propose a change in personal income tax which aims at reducing the tax burden placed on low paid people but at the same time that it would be uh, fiscally neutral because we kind of think that in this political climate and in this historical moment proposing a tax reform that decreases the government revenue is a deal blocker here. So, so the proposal has two basic elements. First is to raise the tax, dedu tax deductible expenses which are related to earning income from paid work four and times, 4.5 4 times. Mm, that's a lot. Uh, please know that this is not the so-called tax-free amount. This is the tax deductible amount which applies only to people earning income from work. This is, a, this is a very important difference here, also from the fiscal point of view. And at the same time, we suggest that the basic personal income tax rate should be increased from 18% to 20%. What does it mean? Does it, it, it does mean that, that the taxation of low paid workers decreases, whereas the tax, which might have some 
probably limited but still positive impacts on the on the labor supply and at the same time the taxation of higher of the the better paid people increases and you can see on this graph how how the tax wedge in this proposal changes in comparison to the status quo the black line is the status quo you can see that it is kind of it 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 is funny anyway, I would say, because the ta total tax switch in Poland at the minimum wage, it's for, it is uh, drawn for the 2013. The tax switch starts at 39%. It kind of increases until you reach, let's say, f triple the minimum wage. Then it's fairly flat. Then it has a spike around two and a half, uh, around the level of two and a half average wage. And then it starts decreasing. So actually, the, the taxation of someone who earns uh, 3,000 euros is more or less the same of the, yeah, as the taxation of someone who earns 1,000 euros with the most burden here. So our proposal means that we reduce the burden placed on the people who are between the minimum wage and in most of the, and let's say like 3,000 lotus. It is, the, the change is visible here. And we increase the taxation here on, and on the, on the top top income. What does it mean when we, when we look on the, on the income distribution? And uh, when you look on the income distribution, we, we see that this is basically fiscally neutral. It even increases the, the revenue. It even increases the revenue of the government by 200 million lotis. These simulations were, were conducted by Michał Mik, who I'm eternally grateful for, that, for, do, for doing that for us. So you can see that, that during to, because of that, 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 that change, the disposa disposable income of households which belong to the, the households of 50% of poorer Poles, they gain totally 403 million zlotys, whereas it is basically financed by higher taxation of the, the fattest 10%, let's say. So, so from the point of view of uh, labor supply incentives and, and merging that from the si with the single contract, I think that it all makes sense. If you have a different views, I, I'd like to answer questions. Also, we have something for the companies, because as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the labor code creates a, ser a range of requirements which, which affect the companies only when they employ worker using employment contracts, and these various require my, my, my requirements, they don't kick in when you employ workers using civil law contracts. Uh, mo se several of these requirements, they don't really affect wages of these workers, nor the dismissal rules. They just create, a, let's say, they increase the cost of operating the company. And, uh, in per and, and, I and because some of these, com some of these, some of these rules made sense when you have a large employer, let's say to have a, a, a dedicated worker for occupational health and safety. In small companies, they don't really make much sense to have a separate worker for occupational health and sa safety. In relation to the total cost of smaller firms, they might be pr more than proportionally punishing, let's say. So there are a couple of proposal skills. What could be changed in the labor code so these costs generated by red tape are lower? And in particular to the small companies employing less than 20 people, we, we, we think that one, one, of this, one, of, one of the things to make their lives easier and, and costs lower is to make, um, currently there is obligation for a periodic medical examination for each worker. And you can't really transfer that between companies. If you switch to a different job, if you switch a post within a company or you change a company, you have to do it again. It costs, uh, one of our workers just made it, it, it costs 200 zlotys, so 50 euros for, for this medical examination. So for so, small companies, I mean, I mean, maybe it's nothing, but, but for some it might be. So it would be good to make these medical obligations kind of like binding for a certain amount of time, or for small companies, uh, maybe they should apply for a particular types of jobs and not when you want to be, let's say, uh, a secretary. Moreover, well, inclusion of family members remuneration in firms costs. Currently, if I were a small employer, we are not that small, but we're, we're still around 20, 20 people something. But if, we, if I were a uh, three-person company or five-person company, and there are many of them in Poland, and if I had a wife, and this wife would be 
employed by me, I cannot include, from the accounting point of view, her wages as a part of the cost, which is ridiculous, because she's a worker uh, as, as anyone else. So that should be, that should be changed. And fortunately, the Chancellor of Pre President is working on that change. Moreover, the dedicated uh, occupational health and safety worker, I mentioned that. And this is one of the, one of the proposals that, that, that creates some additional spending by, by the public sector. That means that sick leave is paid by a firm only up to 14 days of the employee's absence. And above 14 days, that should, we, we say that it might be, or it should be in that case, paid by, by the government. Right now, this, this target is 28, if I remember correctly. This, this threshold is 28. So that would mean that the companies are, the small firms pay less. And, and the general taxation pays more. And plus some changes that we think should be applied across the board for all companies. Uh, if your worker works on Saturday, you should be able to pay him extra money for that and not give him extra day off for that. Because especially during the high peak, high demand in seasonal, in seasonal jobs or in many companies, especially in small companies, that really creates a problem that in the summer you have to uh, your worker works on Saturday and you have to day, give him a day off next week rather than just pay him extra. Plus, another thing which, is, uh, which creates costs which in, from my point of view are completely ridiculous these days is uh, we should scrap the obligation to retain employee files in a paper form for 50 years. Carlos Faber, I always use that example, uh, he, has, he set up a business in the middle 90s. How many people he employs? Nine. nine. He employs nine people and he rates additional garage, a space, to, to, to store all these papers for 50 years. And that creates some, he probably could em employ extra worker using that money because that probably costs like a, like a minimum wage, right? So. I mean, during the digital era, that makes no sense to stall these papers for 50 years. That should be scrapped. So, some questions. Uh, single contract, should it be obligatory for new hires or, 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 or should it be voluntary? Or what, what do we do with the civil law contracts which are binding? And we say that, okay, we scrap civil law contracts. Are these people, do we say that there are no more these contracts or, we trans, trans, or do we transfer them to single law contracts? This is an open question. Uh, should we worry how the increase in the should we worry how the increase in the labor cost translates into external competitiveness of Polish economy? I think that not necessarily, because the slides that on the slide shown by by Joanna, we see that most of these civil law contracts are actually actually implemented or used uh, in the companies which are not really exporting. It's it's mainly services and. Uh, uh, and trade. So, would the would the change in the personal income tax be enough to prevent outflow to shadow economy? Maybe it won't be because if currently the difference in 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 the tax wedge between two types of contracts is around 25 percentage points, our proposal for minimum wage decreases it by like five percentage points. So, there is still huge this gap. So, perhaps we should think about some broader, let's say, redesigning the financing of social security or placing less burden on low paid people here. And, and what here is a deal blocker? Uh, so what element of the proposal should we actually delete to make the Minister of Labor talk to us? Because currently, I know he's in Milano right now, but yeah, as far as I've read on Twitter. So thank you very much. If you want to read the paper, it should be, should be outside. And that's it, and now I would like to give a floor to Roberta for comments. Thank you.